Now, I know a lot of, uh, you know, history goes into these instrument sets and to what the doctors want, but specialty instruments can be compared effectively without affecting surgeon preference. Beyond Clean offers a creative look into the inner workings of a healthcare industry committed to getting it right every instrument, every time. Join us every week as we explore the hidden world of one of the most important aspects of safe surgical care. And now your hosts, Michael Matthews, Hank Balch, and Justin Poulin. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Robert Edelstein, president of Millennium Surgical Corp., a division of Avaline Technologies. Robert has been in the surgical instrument business for over 25 years, and his company, Millennium Surgical, has developed and refined an innovative business model focused on expert support, high-quality U.S. and German-made specialty surgical instruments, and systems which enable hospitals and surgical centers to quickly locate and compare most specialty surgical instruments. Hank, I'm excited for this interview. I love instruments. I love talking about instrument patterns and specialty instruments as well as customization. I know we're going to get into all of that with Robert and talk about cost savings and educational content as well. Yeah, Justin, customization, such a huge question out there. I mean, it's a question that doesn't come up every day, but it's a question that when it comes up, you had better have a good answer for it because these surgeons, if they're saying, hey, this one pattern's not working for me, I, I need something else, it's our jobs to take it from there. So I'm excited to get some vendor perspective on how to tackle those questions from Robert. All right, well, a reminder, you can follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info. The Facebook page is facebook.com slash beyond clean podcast we're also on linkedin linkedin.com slash company slash beyond clean and finally our instagram you'll find us beyond clean podcast where we post anonymous pictures of instruments and cleaning issues every single day if you want to post one of those pictures anonymously on the instagram page or if you have a recommendation for a future topic or guest on the show, simply send us an email to info at beyondclean.net. We'll be right back with Robert Edelstein, president of Millennium Surgical. Joining us now is Robert Edelstein, president of Millennium Surgical. Robert, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start, maybe just do a quick introduction to the listeners about Millennium Surgical and what you do there. My name is Robert Edelstein. The company is Millennium Surgical. Uh, we've been uh, in the industry of specialty surgical instruments for about 25 years, mainly working directly with the OR nurse managers or specialty coordinators and then uh, the central processing managers or instrument techs, helping them to uh, locate, compare, and reduce surgical instruments. Recently, we became aligned with Avaline German Surgical Instruments, which is now the same division as us, focused on importing about 18,000 different types of German surgical instruments. As well. Yeah, Robert, one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on the show in particular, I remember from my early days as a sterile processing technician and then uh, into leadership, a reoccurring question kept coming up again and again from my surgeons about custom instrumentation. And of course, I had not, in my background, I had never had an instrument coordinator role. I hadn't done a lot of instrument ordering myself. So when I would receive those requests, I would turn to my instrument coordinator in the department and say, so where do we go from here? And, you know, one of the names that came up again and again was Millennium Surgical. So when this topic started coming up on a podcast and we were going to get someone on to speak to it, it was a natural fit. Can you speak to kind of overview the difference in a mass marketed typical instrument, I guess, that's in a catalog to something that a surgeon or nurse leader would want to request as custom? I, I think uh, looking at the instrument catalog is a good way to kind of look at the instrument industry a lot of times. You have some of the companies that have an 800-page catalog, 
that covers most of the specialties, often there's 20 or 30 percent of other instrumentation that are brought into those sets that wouldn't be contained in those catalogs. So it's a lot of the outliers that might not come up as often as the broad line instruments. We work with the specialty instrument manufacturers who may be focused specifically on an area like ophthalmology, for instance, and where the broadline companies will cover about 60 to 70 percent of ophthalmology, the specialty companies would deal with the other 30 percent. So it's always that 30 percent that's the most expensive part um, of these sets, and that's the suppliers that we've always worked with and developed relationships with to serve the customers out there. As far as custom instruments, uh, that's been coming up a lot more right now. So from the vendor perspective, then, as we get these surgeon requests on the user side into sterile processing or up to the OR leadership, and we reach out to you and say, hey, this is what the surgeon's asking for. It's not always necessarily because the type of instrument is not available. It could be a number of reasons, but it's your team, you know, that makes those kind of routing decisions, if you will. Can you walk us through what that process is after you get that initial request in from a customer? Typically, it would be a doctor request for an item that is either, you know, a lot of times they want a longer instrument. Sometimes it's something more delicate than they typically have now. And it's always good to get the kind of baseline of what they're using now and, and not satisfied with or used to use and can't receive anymore. A lot of times if they have one item in one set that the doctor wants in all their sets. So we're able to get the information to start by getting a picture of that item and just getting an idea of is it a retractor or a forcep or something along those lines. I know on your website you have something that you have trademarked as the instrument guru. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and how you all came up with that name? Well, that really came about uh, in the early years of the business. We were focused on ambulatory surgery centers, and these centers were often started with a singular focus like ophthalmology, and then the doctors would get together in a board meeting and decide that next week we're going to start doing spine surgery or something simple like that. So it takes (laughs) these nurses who are pretty well in their groove and then throws them into something that they haven't really paid attention to for a long time. So we would often get calls, you know, I'm looking for a retractor and come up with a name. The doctor called it. Uh, well, what is it for? Lumbar spine surgery. And we would, through some diagnosis questions, be able to figure out what they were starting to look for and work with them. Uh, and then it became just a on-call service uh, on the website where people would come in for strange. I want to, I need a mother-in-law grasper. I don't know what that is. And that's a large claw grasper for laparoscopic surgery. So it became became one of those things that people started coming to more and more for items like that. So in the background then through that, do you all have a dictionary maybe that you've created over the last number of years of all of those slang names for instrumentation? Uh, that would have been a very good idea. Okay. It would be a neat idea to do on social media sometime as well. Yeah, give, us all no. the crazy, give us all the crazy names you've heard <laughs> instruments called. <laughs> yeah, I can think of a few, and you know, some are not mentionable on the air. So. <laughs> that, that, that's what I was thinking about. you got to worry about the appropriateness of some of the names. <laughs> That's right. No, but that is, that's a constant challenge on the part of sterile processing leaders because you're right, depending on where the surgeon is from, what coast, or where they were trained, or the familiarity of the tech or the nurse in that service line, you're right. You come up with names sometimes that are either they're slang or they're just an incorrect name for something. And then when they see it, it's like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. So having that outlet on the vendor side to bring those questions to and say, hmm, it looks like, you know, this with the turn in it, then um, being able to go from there because it does happen right now on social media through LinkedIn or it's you see a lot on Facebook, you know, folks will post and say, what is this? Can anyone tell me what this is? Because the surgeon wants some more of them. I wonder how many of those replies come up with somebody else's cultural name for the for the instrument instead of the proper name. Yeah, I was going to say, I learned very early that the specialty surgeons are very specific in what they want. They just don't know what that is that they want. (laughs) And and, and the technicians and nurses have a lot more patience than the typical person would have with that, I'm sure. 
Oh, that's true. Well, so bringing it around again to customization, because I know this is something that's a big question on the user end of it then. Can you talk to the regulatory challenges or issues relating to customizing an existing format of an instrument? Fortunately, the bulk of the requests we get are for class one items. Um, so that makes it much more approachable and able to get the, the process done. So an example is before Christmas time, I got a sample of a 12-inch mixture forcep that the doctor wanted to have thicker tips on. So that's a fairly straightforward process. They were good enough to measure the tips that they had and uh, nail the, the surgeon down on exactly additional width. Um, and it was based off a fairly uh, standard pattern, but wanted it to be a little bit heavier. And that was a pretty straightforward process. I think it took about six to eight weeks. So we we started with a sample with uh, modifications required and was able to deliver that within six weeks. A lot of tractor items these days are different like versions of home ends or different versions of knee or hip retractors. So a lot of that can just be dealt with through discussion with the surgeon or starting with a sample and making the modifications from there. And you don't run into any issues like around 510K with that because it's class one, correct? Right. Class one items do not require 510K. Because you run into all these things sometimes too where people say custom versus modification and the modification word kind of becomes this weird buzzword. But I think about it with like coatings because sometimes you've gotten into conversations with customers about dipping in an instrument or adding insulation to an instrument that didn't have it before. And they say that's a modification, and I guess technically it is, but would that also fall under that class one, similar to what you're describing there? Uh, It depends upon the intended use of the insulation. So if it's going to be used in like electrosurgical, then often that takes that into a class two device. So it's a lot of times, and this has been a learning curve for me over the last couple of years, is the tension of the marketing of the device, even where it's listed in a catalog can be looked at. And it seems kind of arbitrary to me, but you look at where it's being marketed to. Is it a curette being marketed for spine surgery or a curette being marketed for surgery in the base of the head? And that might depend upon the class. So it's a pretty complicated, uh, and there's a lot of different interpretations on that out there as well. Well, that's what I was thinking. There's gray area there, and it seems like it's always uh, somewhat of a fine line, but I think you answered it really well, just describing the intended use. I'm thinking more along the lines of just putting a coating on, not even necessarily for anything electrosurgical, but you think about dipping. If people really get crazy with it, even adding tape identification to an instrument could be considered a modification, but the way you just put it helps, I think, the listeners who have always wondered about where that line is really helps them kind of understand that a little bit better and and in a simple way. The issue is that class one is not going to be as easy as it is now for much longer. And I believe it's 2020, all class one has to go through UDI also. And it's going to be an enormous burden for uh, most companies. And you and I never discussed this offline, but I'd be interested to, to hear from you how many hospitals are going to adopt tracking to the UDI level by 2020. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think even with UDI, it's still by model number. I don't think they require it to go directly to the specific instrument. No, they are. Uh, all class two are tied directly to the instrument now. Specifically and, uh, the direct, instrument, not direct, the instrument direct pattern. Marketing, right. And starting in 2020, I mean, virtually every medical device. Well, you'll have to have a tracking system, I would think. UDI law is definitely a big undertaking. From the standpoint of making tracking systems more effective, we've talked about it on the show before, being able to take those instructions for use and then parse them out by location. If every device has a unique identifier and the requirements in UDI law, and I remember seeing this as kind of a a small bullet point in a large presentation that was given several years back in Pennsylvania by the current president of ARM saying that essentially that instructions 
for the device would be something that would be held in that repository. So I don't know what kind of standards there would be around that data. I haven't dove into that, but that's an implication that could be positive if they did do that. But speaking of instructions for use on this line of thinking, go back to, okay, so class one and not needing 510K, does anything change regarding the instructions for use when you do a custom device or because it's class one, it kind of falls under that whole umbrella? Well, I mean, typically, if you're taking a, a hemostat and putting a thicker tip on it, it's not going to change the sterilization parameters. So, you know, typically these are items that are stainless steel retractors, non-cannulated, you know, fairly uh, straightforward devices that it's not going to be different if you sterilize a 9-inch homin versus a 10-inch homin. So that's kind of where they fall into most of the time. So we can look to the manufacturer, look to our IFU and see that it comes under those IFUs. One of the questions that came up on our interview with Daniel Cole from the UK company Surgical Holdings, he's a manufacturer over there in England, the question was innovation in surgical instrumentation, and he had a presentation that he presented at a conference there, and I believe their company won an award for some of the innovation in their own manufacturing. But on the U.S. side of things, you know, from the vendor perspective, considering some of the challenges that we were just talking about in regards to customization, do you feel like surgical instrument innovation is still alive in the U.S., or have we seen uh, our best days behind us? I would say follow the money, um, the the higher value or, or higher expense procedures, you know, spine, um, neurosurgery, cardiovascular. I think there's still a lot of developments and specialty items going into those markets. Um, you look at some of the, the other procedures that have kind of uh, normalized. Um, there's not as much going into like the cataract market uh, in development versus like the retina market now. So the retina market became hot. Uh, there's more development, more money being spent in those areas, and there's more new instrumentation coming out there. So if you kind of look at it that way, it's, it's we'll show you where the newer type of stuff is coming out. Newer, more expensive, and harder to clean as well. All right. Th- that's all really good information. We're going to come right back with Robert to talk about cost savings, instrument purchasing, and education initiatives as well. We're back with Robert Edelstein, president of Millennium Surgical. And Robert, I know we're going to talk about three things in this segment, cost savings, instrument purchasing, as well as educational initiatives. But I think the first thing we'll talk about is cost savings. And usually people immediately think of group purchasing organizations when you start talking about cost savings and their contracts with manufacturers. So... Let's start there and just talk about do GPOs result in cost savings on surgical instrument purchases? Well, our focus as a company has always been on the specialty instrumentation. So we've always had a broad line, but focused on working with our customers on the specialty instruments. Over the last 15 years, the the GPOs have become much more used by the facilities and uh, have had good success with using the GPO, but when they're using the GPO, it's usually for about the 60% of the basic or or instruments that would go into set. And what uh, we find is that 20% uh, of the instruments that are purchased outside of the GPO usually make up about 60% of the budget for a facility. So they're doing great on getting the cost of hemostats and knife handles down to the lowest price ever, but often they lose their budget or spend their budget on those 20% of the specialty items that come up, and that's really where we focus a lot of our time. From the vendor perspective, then, if you were if you were speaking to a sterile processing leader, trying to help them save that budget, then instead of blow it on the more specialty items, how would you educate them to speak maybe to their supply chain leaders and explain that situation in regard to the GPO? Well, really, what what we have done with uh, different organizations is is really look at the items that come in from either the non-contracted sources. So if you you take the instrument list that uh, are being purchased on a six-month basis and look at, let's say, your contract is with vendor X, what are the items that aren't being purchased from vendor X? 
and why are these items being purchased from the vendors that they are, and are they being compared before they're purchased? Now, I know a lot of uh, you know history goes into these instrument sets and to what the doctors want, but specialty instruments can be compared effectively without affecting surgeon preference. So a company like ours is able to match up the instrument style specifically and back it up with a surgeon satisfaction guarantee. Um, And a lot of times we'll suggest using a rule of about $200 that if the item is $200 or more, no matter if it's coming from the contracted vendor or the specialty vendor, compare cost on that instrument. Really, that's pointing out that it's not a commodity instrument and there could be savings on those instruments. That's great. Yeah, that's helpful. So GPO aside then, what are some other tips then for sterile processing folks who know, I mean, always, every year I know I'm praying for a larger instrument budget and it typically shrinks. And the challenge is not just, you know, getting high quality instrumentation in at a good value, but it's also trying to keep the items that we do have in-house and not ending up in the trash or a vendor's tray that's walking out the door or what have you. That's a topic for another episode. But on the savings side of things, then, what are some other tips that you could give to leaders to use their budget more effectively? Well, really focusing on the surgeon preference items and understanding why are the doctors asking for this? Are they asking for this brand because that moniker they have for it and they know it by that name or they know it by that number? Or are they really saying this is the only instrument that if you hand me, I will use and I will walk out of this operating room if you don't give it to me now? The good thing is those days are mostly behind us, but there are still doctors who will insist upon the the brand name being stamped on the instrument, and it doesn't matter what else you could do for him or her. We like to focus on why does a doctor have this preference, and if you can deliver an instrument that has the same weight, feel, and performance, will the doctor be satisfied with that, and will the doctor be willing to use that instrument? And if they, if the doctor is, is interested in that, then typically they uh, can convert that doctor. And the good thing is that, let's say you're building a set this year for cardiovascular surgery and you switch out two needle holders and save $1,200, next year you might buy four of those sets. So instead of replacing them with the expensive line, you now can go to the replacement that's a lower cost. So once you do the work that may be a little challenging up front, the, the payoff goes down line in spades. That's a great point, too, because a lot of what you're describing is set optimization. The more standardization, the better for the customer, and also just the interchangeability when they're putting sets up and making them available to multiple surgeons. I know in some cases... There may be different types of sets with a lot of common instruments in it, and we're not really talking about that type of set optimization. It's more optimizing and standardizing the patterns that would be typically used in sets. Is that kind of what you're getting at there? Well, I'm getting is that if you have sets that are have this 20 or 30 specialty instruments in them, if you've just always bought them from vendor X without comparing. So you're comparing and you're using your GPO for 80% of the items and you're scrubbing your cost on those items. But then you have these six specialty instruments in there that no one's ever looked at. Why are we buying it from here? And what are we paying for it? And could we be paying less? It just becomes a standard, oh, we need these every time thing versus could we do better on these products? So going down that line a little deeper then, and I know this is something that I saw in a previous newsletter that came out from your team, but we've all encountered um, a purchasing decision maybe that was made not by the sterile processing department. So we get this new tray and it shows up at our door and we're thinking, man, there sure are a lot of instruments in this tray and um, probably Dr. So-and-so is not going to use them all. And that goes back, you know, to, I guess, being able to distinguish not only what the surgeon is requesting, but then also what is the OEM, what are they sending in response to that request, and is it specific to the needs, or is it a standard cookie cutter, we give this tray to every doctor who's doing these types of procedures, regardless of what the particular uses are for this facility. And there could be a lot of waste there as well correct? Yeah, for sure. And, and I would even take that back to when doctors 
transfer from one facility to another facility, which, as you probably know, is happening on a much more regular basis these days. The the surgeons seem to move around quite a bit. And what ends up happening is if, if we're lucky, the facility is able to get count sheets from the other facility, but often they don't go to the trouble of saying, well, who was this set developed for? Uh, and they end up finding out it, it might have been six doctors instead of the one doctor. So they start building these great big sets based on old information, and no one actually goes through and, and streamlines those sets. So we'll look at that a lot of times. A, a good example is a set for sinus endoscopy. If you see a bunch of biters in there that aren't through cut biters and a bunch of through cut biters in the same set, you pretty much know that they had the non through cuts in there and then added the through cuts and probably the doctors haven't touched the other biters for six years now. But they're gonna go and buy four more sets just like it. So we'll make the recommendation, you know, you have almost the same instrument and in non through biting and through biting. Do the doctors use any of the old style anymore? And nine times out of 10, they'll come back. No, none of them use them. Take them out. Six instruments at $450 a piece. They just eliminate it from their set just by asking the question. Yeah, that's a really good point. Just scrubbing those count sheets and, you know, just another issue that would, that you've already described that would rear its ugly head in that scenario is not having the proper names again. But now you're at a new facility with the surgeon. They're very interested in clarifying that, um, the name of that instrument, what it really means, but maybe the old facility that that count sheet came from is not so interested in helping you out in determining which one was supposed to go into the set. I'm assuming you have some standard or common patterns for different types of sets as well that you can use to give them a baseline to review. We do have suggested sets. We really work to stay away from them um, because the specialty procedures often, the doctors are, as I said earlier, very specific in what they want. So we'll make some suggestions, supply some pictures, but really look for the uh, surgeon to get involved if, if there's nothing to work from. But that that has been a problem in, in the recent years where everyone used to work together from a, a set list perspective. Now everyone seems to hold on to their list and not want to give it up in between facilities unless they're owned by the same uh, company these days. One of the reasons that we created this podcast was to facilitate education and communication of that education across the globe. We're doing the same job here in the U.S. as they're doing in Europe, as they're doing in Asia. A surgery should be safe no matter where you have it done. That's part of the vision uh, for why we have the show. So today we're excited to speak to you a little bit too about the new, improved, updated instrument reprocessing poster that your team is coming out with. Can you speak to the background to that poster, the vision for education, then kind of what's involved in that. It'll be hitting departments here soon. We originally developed this poster in uh, late 2009. We were, again, focused very much at that time on the ambulatory surgery centers, and often they were coming to us with questions about sterile processing and reprocessing. We were not in a great position to give them much guidance, so we went out and worked with Uh, Rose Seavey, who uh, is well-known in the ARN community, and she was actually uh, the president of the American Society of Healthcare Essential Service Professionals, amongst many other things she's been involved in. So we worked with her to develop a poster showing the basic and important steps of instrument reprocessing. Back then, it's the same as it is today. It's a uh, poster that's 18 by 24 inches. It's laminated on both sides uh, with grommets suitable for hanging in the sterilization area. And we speak to facilities that we uh, distributed this poster to in 2010, and they remind us that the poster is still on their wall. We felt it was necessary with the heightened awareness of infection control to update the poster, which we did uh, with Rose this summer and uh, reformat the poster and are, have made it available for distribution at this time. So did it get bigger with all the changes in the industry? Not bigger, no. <laughs> uh, that was a challenge. Uh, my original notes to Rose were were quite long and detailed, and, and we, we really had to work to 
boil it down to visuals, most important, uh, something just to have in front of OR staff or the CS staff, kind of like the OSHA poster. You know, what should we all be thinking about each day? Well, that visual representation is extremely important. We've heard it a thousand times. The picture is worth a thousand words. And I know that even in in in-services, you can describe what they should be doing and whatnot, but it's showing and doing and taking pictures is really key. But the reference, I always know when I walk into a department, how much of an emphasis they place on education when there's all kinds of reminders and visual tips that are up on the walls, you know, for using the equipment and inspection points, et cetera. So I commend you for putting that together as well. It's easy to get. You go to our website, which is uh, surgicalinstruments.com, which we hope is easy for all listening to this podcast to remember. And uh, it's right on the front page. You can see it and just click on there and uh, give us your address. And it typically will get uh, mailed out U.S. mail within the next uh, two weeks of receipt of the request. You read my mind. That's exactly where I was going. How can listeners get one? So that definitely is an easy website. Everybody can get there. And Robert, I want to thank you for coming on to the show. You did a really nice job. I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us. At Isham this year, we have a big event coming up. So you're, as a guest of the show, welcome to come. I think it's going to be on Tuesday night. Is that right, Hank? That's correct. Tuesday evening, 5.30. We'll be pushing out more info on it soon. Sounds great. Thanks for the invite. That was Robert Edelstein, president of Millennium Surgical Corp, a division of Avaline Technologies. And Hank, I really like the poster. I'm big on visual educational guides, reminders, especially because as you and I know, there's a lot of turnover in the department and every little bit of reinforcement for helping everybody who is newer on the job to just make sure that they're following all the guidelines, as many of the IFUs as possible, and just the basic premises of cleaning and sterilizing surgical equipment is key. So cheers to Robert and his team for putting the poster together. I love the story of um, the departments that had their original poster in 2009, and here it is nine years later, and it's still hanging up, you know, getting good use, but... Obviously, a lot of things have changed in that amount of time and a lot of focus, as he said, from these accrediting organizations that are zeroing in on the little things in SPD. So it is great to push that education out there. I had a great time with Robert just speaking on the cost savings opportunities. That is our everyday life as sterile processing leaders trying to squeeze as much quality out of a shrinking budget as possible. And I think he gave us some great tips. Hopefully they help folks. That's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank, Mike, and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.